Okay, folks, it's wonderful to be given the graveyard slot, uh, standing between you and the rest of your, your weekend. I'm going to try something different uh, today. Um, my head is hurting, like many of our heads are hurting because of the amount of ideas and discussions. And what I've got to draw upon here is trying to bring some of those together. Uh, unlike most of you, I'm also hurting because I had a, a fall on my bicycle as well. Um, which you'd think I'd learn after 40 fucking years of cycling, I could, uh, and not even the, the excuse of being drunk, uh, and so on. So for me, it's been a wonderful uh, weekend. I want you to sit back and relax, because what I'm going to do today is as much about how I'm going to use PowerPoint properly for the first time in my uh, career, as in lots of images and memes and so on. And I think there are important ways of communicating the issues that we've been discussing. It's what I call the Mammy Barry test. Uh, that when I go home to my mother, who is uh, a tough working class woman from North Dublin, and I talk about capitalism and neoliberalism, she says, fuck off, what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, the reality is that many of us are activists in, in communities, that that language, while it's important in terms of analysis and the educate bit of educate, agitate, and organize, for most working class people, that is not where, where they're at. And then when you talk about the planetary crisis, and I take Saoirse's point precisely, let's not just focus on the climate, there's also a biodiversity crisis. Again, that's very abstract. You know, you've heard that phrase. For a lot of working class people, it's hard to think about the end of the world when they can't think about the end of the week. Uh, but I do think we are now at a point where the cost of living crisis and the planetary crisis both stem from the same sources and both have solutions that we can co-create together. So I was going to initially call call this the Educate, Agitate, Organise, but now it's an eco-socialist revolution. Um, shooting is optional, looking at uh, Paul here. Or, I now am of the view, and I've been a long time uh, Marxist and a, a believer in, in the Marxist analysis, the normative, as well as the you know, um, critical elements of political economy and Marxism, I now think we're at a stage, and I will be using some of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports that come out this year, we now have functional reasons for eco-socialism. So it's not just about normative arguments of making the world a better place, of having a less inegalitarian, socially unjust society, but purely now in terms of human survivability and habitability, uh, we have to move beyond ecocidal capitalism. Or indeed, as I said, why the cost of living crisis is now connected to the planetary crisis. But really, I think it's not a cost of living crisis. And let's start calling it what it is. It's a cost of profiteering crisis. I am sick to my back teeth hearing the mainstream media and mainstream politicians blaming the war in Ukraine on fucking everything. BP made its second largest profit in three months in this year, seven billion pounds uh, prior to the war in Iraq. It's across the profiteering crisis that we're now facing. So this is my uh, innovation. I, I call it infotainment, this way of uh, doing public speaking. And I'm particularly the Louise uh, Michel quote here. And I'll be making some suggestions of privileged knowledge workers like me in the academy that your taxes pay for, so enjoy. I hope you enjoy it. There is a particular onus on, I think, the likes of myself and Paul and Stevie Baker and others of you involved in the education system. How can we use our, our privilege uh, at this time of crisis? And particularly with a hat tip to uh, Sean Sweeney, who I, oh, there he is. Uh, the importance of what Sean was talking about. This is a great dinner party uh, issue or down the pub. And it really underscores the centrality of energy. Energy is not just about what's powering this uh, discussion, the lights, uh, the heating, and so on. Our food system, you know, to go back to what Sersha and Paul were talking about, you know, the amount of energy it takes to fix nitrogen, which is a major ingredient in modern industrial agriculture, uh, is enormous. And a lot of people would die if we couldn't fix nitrogen to artificially increase the fertility of the, of the soil. So almost all our civilization is based upon energy. And the problem is we, we've hit upon, um, particularly since the last 100 years, oil in particular is incredibly energy dense. We've never found anything as energy dense and as portable. We can move oil about um, quite a bit. The problem with oil is, is one, it's fossil. 
fossil fuel. So when we burn a barrel of oil, it isn't coming back in any meaningful time frame for humanity. It's gone. And it's also the major cause of the planetary crisis. Although it has to be said, in relation to the issue in Ireland, is that we have an unsustainable beef and dairy herd. And the main problem there is producing methane. And methane is a much more potent gas, although it lasts less long in the atmosphere. So let's be like Yoda in terms of saying that what we're facing um, is, in a way, as one of my students said, and they titled their latest chapter, um, barbarism if we're lucky. It used to be an old socialist phrase, you know, socialism or barbarism. Now it's at the stage, barbarism if we're lucky, uh, which tells us what a state of chassis that we're in, uh, to use the Juno and the Paycock. I already mentioned one of my great uh, heroes, and there'll be lots of South American references uh, you'll see in my talk, Chico Mendes, Ecology Without Class Struggle is, is Gardening. Um, but also some positive signs. I mean, I notice, I mean, obviously, maybe Paul would know more about this, but I know Jeremy Corbyn, and, and I put this bit in because I thought he was going to be here. Uh, I also brought over a book I wanted him to sign, so the fecker is going to have to come back at some other point. But the way in which Jeremy Corbyn and his uh, foundation on, on peace and justice is linking up now with Just Stop Oil is a positive sign of that red-green uh, collaboration. Um, and apologies to those who've heard me say this many times over many years, as a self-confessed Marxist lentilist, think about that, <laughs> I particularly welcome this watermelon green uh, combination. But just yesterday I was reading, in, and again I take VJ's point about The Guardian not always been uh, the progressive paper that it should be, but there was an article in yesterday's Guardian of the phenomenal success a bit like Piketty, you know, in his uh, book on capital, how that was a very popular book a few years ago. Uh, this book by Kohei Sato on basically Marxism and eco-socialism has just taken off, particularly amongst young people in, uh, in, in Japan. And in particular, uh, you can't see it all there. What, what he starts out with is saying, uh, the sustainable development goals are the new opium of the people. And many of us, I see it in the university, uh, all myself and my colleagues' research are now bads with one of these 17 SDGs. I know corporations, NGOs, other businesses and so on are all using these SDGs as somehow the solution. Uh, and I think uh, they obviously aren't, and I'd be interested, I don't know this particular um, person here, but I'd certainly be interested in reading uh, their book. And I do think there is a major issue on this island and the other about the distraction of Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol. You know, there's only so many crises you can take before you head to the pub very, very <laughs> quickly. But I do think this is the condition in which everything we have to do uh, now should be orientated. And I do think, you know, there, it, it, I, I could give you a talk about how the coronavirus, the war in Ukraine, and the cost of living crisis and the planetary crisis are all coming from the same place. Just to give you an example of the coronavirus, it was the encroachment into wilderness areas in, in parts of the world, Wuhan, whoever knew about that until it all happened, um, as a result of capitalist development. That we are releasing pathogens and viruses that human beings never came up against. Uh, and that's how these viruses are going to increase in the future. So the same cause, so there's no separate crisis. These are all one crisis with diff just different elements in terms of all these issues. So here's some of the science, and now we have, we always had science, I think, to back up progressive politics, but to me it's now screamingly uh, obvious in terms of some of these IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, reports. Now this, this is the typical kind of scientist way of presenting their arguments. So this is the last statement of that report that came out. They came out with about three reports this year. And it says there, any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Now that's the equivalent of the world's scientists fucking screaming at the top of their voices. Because it's a very conservative uh, organization. It's not just pure science. It's uh, overseen then by governments and policymakers. So the science that comes out of it is actually quite conservative. But if, even if they're saying this is a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity, 
this frightens the life out of me because I spoke about this and we've had discussions with some of you that for me, what motivates me is the fact that I'm a father. I have kids. Uh, future generations have faces and names now for me. And I'm reading these reports about what their lives are going to be like in the future. And if you're not shit scared and then angry, and then maybe a bit depressed and it's okay to be all of those things, you're not reading the signs correctly. Some of you may be familiar with that Kubler-Ross cycle. It used to be called the grieving cycle. It's when you're met with something really shocking, a death in the family, a, you know, a diagnosis or something like a, a seriousness of the extinction of human civilization by the end of this or the next century. Our first reaction is often denial. And we do have a lot of climate denial. And it's a defensive mechanism that is psychologically good because you don't want to be having too much bad stuff in your life. Then it moves to often anger. Who are you angry about? Who do you shoot, as Paul said? And then there is depression. And this is my daily life as an academic and researcher in this area. But I do think, and it has come up in various ways in Sarah's discussion, the importance of kindness, of checking in with each other, that certainly for me, I think we should be unapologetic that we're fighting for our children and grandchildren. And not just ours and that kind of golem, my precious, as if it's just ours. All kids and grandkids, that's how serious the situation is. So I do believe now, in a way that I didn't maybe 20 years ago, where I was more ideologically committed to eco-socialism or, or Marxism and the change in society, that we now have literally functional reasons. In part, as I'll show, and it's partly my own expertise, is the impossibility of a non-growing capitalism. Capitalism is a cancer. The definition of cancer is a, a cell that outgrows the capacity of the organism to be healthy. So what I'm going to offer you is a, not a, an anti-growth position. Growth is good up to a point. But after a threshold, it becomes uneconomic, it becomes maladaptive, malfunctioning, and doesn't actually add to human flourishing. And particularly GDP and, and the fetish around GDP, gross domestic product. So here's the professorial bit. So GDP is the measure of all goods and services spent in the economy. That includes things. I wouldn't recommend from personal experience the first two together. <laughs> but what also adds to GDP? Divorce. Even pollution can add to GDP, the amount of litigation and so on that are involved. Things that we might call negative, of course, except in the fact that sometimes separation is, uh, is a good thing. But generally speaking, we like to see people in happy relationships. But sadly, wars are also good for GDP. And I gather most of us here would be anti-war, anti-imperialist, but actually you can trace, particularly in America or other large capitalist countries, whenever they go to war, ching ching, this is good. War is good for business and business is good. In other words, the GDP measure does not distinguish which bit of GDP is about education, producing a bicycles or good beer, as opposed to munitions to kill people. But what doesn't get included in our GDP? The unpaid work of mostly women. The very real care labor, that reproductive work without which our societies wouldn't function. When was the last time, as I mentioned the other day, when you heard GDP or economic analysis, including the unpaid work of women? The volunteer work that many of us get involved in our communities doesn't get, because it's not a monetary exchange, it doesn't get included in GDP. And then last, and I would see what we're doing here, I don't just mean democracy, but political activism, that is work. Many of us are here in, in a voluntary capacity. We're committed, we perhaps enjoy it, um, but it is work that doesn't get included in our economic statistics because we're not getting mostly paid uh, for these things. In other words, GDP is not a good measure of what's going on in society and certainly not a good measure of progress, but capitalism is addicted to increasing GDP every year. And the first reason what's wrong with GDP, you can read it there yourself, this is the ideal GDP hero in a modern capitalist society. Each stage of this degenerate's life, ching ching, adds to more goods and services being produced, consumed and advertised. That's the first problem. I, I would suspect most of us don't want to have this person as a GDP figure. The second reason, and there's one that's more particular to Ireland, jobless growth. Now, it's not peculiar to Ireland, but it is a phenomenon that we see because of our heavily 
uh, indebted, or uh, our economy is heavily indebted to the corporate sector. And a report from 2015, so we had 26.3% growth. No fucking jobs. And Conor McCabe was here, be able to tell you, walk you around the IFSC in Dublin and see all of these copper-plated businesses not creating one screed of jobs, but GDP is off the wazoo. And that's what we get from the boardroom to the bar room. People are talking about growth, and we have this innate sense that somehow growth is good, because it carries with it a sense of maturation, of development, and so on. I go back to that idea of cancerous growth. What is the threshold beyond which growth has now become negative for a people, a society, and the land? And I'd say we've well passed it here. What we need in Ireland, and most advanced, in inverted commas, countries in the global north, in the minority world, is not more growth. We need redistribution. And the reason I say that is that for most people, Something like this works in their head. Well, we don't really need redistribution because the cake is growing out of a little bit bigger of a slice next year. So in other words, growth itself is used as a way of downplaying demands for redistribution. And that's been explicit in the development of, of the ideology, if you like, of economic growth over the past 40 years. So I think we, as eco-socialists, should be demanding to move beyond growth and to focus on things like Paul was mentioning and others, focusing on resources and redistributing, using those resources in a way to meet human, human needs. But scientists are now becoming increasingly uh, adamant about the importance of moving beyond economic growth. This is a, um, sorry, a, 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 um, a letter that was written two years ago by world scientists. I was one of them. There's about 20,000 of us across the world who signed this particular uh, letter as a world, uh, warning on the climate emergency. And what we said in that, you can see, our goals need to shift from GDP growth. So it's no longer, if you like, ideological or normative or moral in terms of moving beyond growth. It is now a functional requirement for a habitable Earth. More recently, another IPCC report. Read it there yourself. If we want to have a chance, and two degrees is a fucking disaster, by the way. We're already at about 1.2 degrees of global warming. And those of you who lived in London have already experienced 40 degrees unprecedented. We've mentioned a few times the devastating floods in Pakistan. There's also been the experience in India and Pakistan earlier on this year of a billion people in a heat dome, the weather of which was so severe, birds were falling out of the sky. This is apocalyptic. You know, the reality is that we're now facing a crisis in the climate where we will not be able to escape from it. Ireland is relatively uh, blessed in many respects. Low population density. We have the Gulf Stream that keeps the place temperate, but that could shut off. If that Gulf Stream that brings warm water from the Caribbean, if that gets shut off, we have a new ice age here. So the issues are that we cannot escape these. There is no way, unless you're fucking Elon Musk and want to go off to Mars, and I'll mention him in, in a moment. Uh, we have to deal with this in the here and and now, but this is sadly the capitalist response. And just as I said, capitalist, uh, a cup rolled off Saoirse MacHugh's knee, trying to escape. Like, stay there, you capitalist bastard. <laughs> is that, there's profits to be made in extinction, and partly to do with the way in which the capitalist system is focused on the next quarter. You know, I'm talking about looking at kids and grandkids. I mean, there is, and I don't want to be appropriating native peoples, but there's a lot of good wisdom in Aboriginal thinking, of things like seventh generation thinking, that we shouldn't be making any big decisions now until we see, well, how's this going to affect people seven generations ahead, rather than the short-term profit-making? It's almost akin to the guy who falls out of the, you know, the skyscraper, and he was heard to say at each floor, oh, so far, so good. That's the situation that we're now in. But even, it's not just scientists, even, you know, not particularly radical organizations at the UN, and a fair play to uh, Guterres in terms of, I don't know what Kool-Aid he's been drinking, but he's certainly coming out much stronger on a lot of these issues that I think we can use and say, well, it's not just us saying it. Look at all these scientists, look at Antonio Guterres as a way, in a way, I think, of often you know, winning people over. You know, that the radicals are those who want to continue with the fossil fuel economy. And, you know, I think 
Michelle was mentioning in terms of student organisation, up at Queen's University where I work, there was a divestment campaign. It's not been completely successful. The university has said they look into the usual, they look into how to move away from it. But in my own union, and Steve Baker is here as a member, and so is Paul, the University Colleges Union, our own pensions that we're about to take strike action on probably the next few months, they are invested in fossil fuels. And I think it's that issue we need to get clear about. There's no simple, you know, bunch of capitalist bastards and all the rest of us are shiny and let's get rid of them and it's going to go. It's a much more complicated issue than that. Our pension schemes are invested in fossil fuels. So it's going to take some untangling around these issues. But also, th there is evidence that people around the world, and this was largely based in the global south, where there's actually a much greater appetite for greater action on climate action, because they can see it right here and right now. But people are not realizing the extent of the changes that we are going to experience in the years ahead. I think it's our job, in a way, to prepare people for things like almost the full electrification of our lives. Forget about electric vehicles as the solution. We will need green powered trains, green hydrogen for buses and, and large heavy goods vehicles and so on. But the idea that somehow we switch from a fossil fuel based private car system to a renewable energy one is crap. We already talked about the lithium, the cadmium, the zinc, these rare earth metals that are often mined in horrendous human rights abusing conditions as well as environmental damage. But also more generally, we need to challenge the narrative, which is often a very techno-optimistic narrative of what I would call biofueling the Hummer. That somehow we just plug and play, take out the bad fossil fuels and then stick in some green energy. That's green capitalism. That's not what we should be fighting for. It's a much greater transformation of our societies. And listen to Ron. <laughs> Fucking amazing to think, as a smart species, we have no excuse for not knowing what it is that we're, we're going through. I think perhaps our parents' and grandparents' generation could be forgiven for not really realizing that the consumer, globalized, fossil fuel-based lifestyles and economies that were built, particularly after the Second World War, they didn't realize uh, the impacts of this. We do know this, and I do think, and again, uh, encouraging you as activists to call out or call upon particularly scientists or academics like myself and ask NUIG, University of Limerick, Waterford Institute of Technology, UCD, Trinity College Dublin, University of Ulster, Queen's University, Letterkenny Institute, Sligo Institute, UCC. What the fuck are you doing? Because some of these colleagues, you know, they're not, they're mostly on the climate science, the more technical natural science side, and I've met some of them, and some of them are clinically depressed. These are scientists who are doing their job, you know, they're often involved in ice core drilling and seeing about the, the trends in, you know, um, how the climate has changed. And what they do is they do their job and they hand it over to governments and say, well, there you go now, um, go away and, and, and implement that. And they've been doing that for decades and nothing has happened. And so some of them, as I say, are depressed, which is very sad because they're dealing with that issue. I, I often think myself, I'm a quite a happy person, but I, I'm not depressed, but I think I'm a carrier. Um, so bad it's become now in a way that it, on my modules at Queen's University Belfast, I had to put trigger warnings because I've, I've come to realize that I'm often leaving my students depressed because for a lot of people, this is very, very new and it's worse than they think. It's worse than they think. But I don't want to leave them depressed, so you have to show some sort of action. And I'm going to give you, you know, in case I don't get to it, action comes and it delivers hope. Optimism is passive. Hope is active. But it also holds out the possibility of failure, to go back to what Vinay was saying last night in terms of the zigzag. We have to allow the possibility of failure. But then as my father, wise peasant from County Wicklow, always says, when you lose, don't lose the lesson. And there's something uh, in that. This has been overly abused. Thanks, Steve Baker, for stealing my thunder on that one. Um, but it is true. Picky for my young students who I see every year, they live completely in a capitalist imaginary. They can't even think of a world outside, except, oh, the Soviet Union, authoritarianism. He's oh, for fuck's sake, you want to go through this again? But it is about a failure of imagination. And I do think that's something that we need to bring as activists, as popular educators in our communities, often the solutions are in the room. Working class people have been struggling 
for centuries, helping each other out, finding solutions to problems, particularly when they have access to the resources and some degree of distributed leadership and, and education. So it is, and I'll leave you with some ideas of this towards the, towards the end. This is particularly to um, the academics and those of you involved in the academy in the room. What is our responsibility? And it does seem to be amazing that I'm surrounded by very bright colleagues at my university and I'd be globally connected with other academics. And I'd say to them, are you not as shit scared as me? Why aren't you getting involved in this? And I don't know what it is, whether it's a, a false sense of liberal reformism that the system would somehow correct itself or it can't be as bad as that and so on. But I do think if the initiative is not coming from within the academy, and as I say, we are not you know, privileged knowledge workers with expertise that can help in campaigns and so on. I think it's for you, particularly because your taxes pay for our wages, to be asking academics. Don't be waiting for them to come out to you, to ask, come on, what, you, you're an expert on this issue. Come and help us. Is ground source heat pumps any, any good? You know, what about community-owned wind farms? What about nationalizing the energy system? What, have, what needs to happen to the grid and so on? It shouldn't be for you in terms of having to scramble around to do the research, although many of you do that anyway. Go to somebody in the university and demand that they have a public responsibility now in the time of this planetary crisis. We cannot continue with a business as usual education system. And so my own prospect, and this is what I've come to see, my own activism is kind of return to the old hedge schools. And I'm offering myself, to those of you who are activists across this island, to call upon me to come down uh, and talk either, you know, ele electronically, you know, maybe not Zoom, because I didn't know Zoom, Zoom excluded Cuba, so there's another feckin' platform I can't use now. But uh, physically going down or helping, or if not me, connecting with other colleagues across the university system on the island of Ireland that I would call who give a shit. You know, there are those of us who have woken up to this issue. Uh, woke as fuck. And this is the problem, I think. For many of us, maybe it's, it explains why some of my colleagues aren't as, as agitated and often as fearful as me. But also in the media, um, you know, we get this narrative that somehow tech is going to save the day. You know, that somehow a whiz-bang technology, and none of us here are Luddites, and although have to say asterisks on this one, the Luddites get a bad press. They were just working class people concerned at the undemocratic way changes in technology were. But technology is going to be needed, but it will not save us. We need structural changes in how our economy works. And we need to call out this bullshit, this really risky narrative that's been put out there by mainstream media, by most political parties and so on, that somehow, you know, yeah, there's a problem but we're working on it. Look at flop 26, as I call it. What happened in Glasgow, where their fucking ambition was, get this, let's keep 1.5 alive. Fucking keep it <laughs> I mean, this system, like what Saoirse was saying, the system isn't going to come and save us. But I do think most of our citizens are under the false impression that academics like me are doing the reports, we're giving them to the government, and they're going to sort it out. That is not going to happen. We are in a system of sustainable degradation. Systems are breaking down uh, all around us. And the new bullshit word, green growth. Green growth, that somehow we can decouple a growing economy from energy use, from resource use, and so on, there is no empirical evidence for this. This is now not even ideological thinking. It's fucking mythic. And this gets serious coverage in the media, in the academy, in strategy discussions that somehow we can continue growing our economy while decoupling it. And of course, the, why do we have to grow the economy? That's the capitalist accumulation imperative for shareholders in terms of their quarterly returns. And particularly annoying, uh, and I've, I've managed to kind of wheedle my way into the BBC in the north who get me on now and again. I've even managed to get in prime time radio, five o'clock. I've even mentioned capitalism in a bad way, uh, and they still invite me back. Um, it's this narrative that somehow you get serious attention to the idea of colonizing Mars, 
But if you start challenging capitalism, oh, that's utopian. And I do think we have to call that out for, for people. And this is socialism. I should have put barbarism if we're, if we're lucky. So what do we need? A political strategy to organize the working class. Here, try some of this Marxist lentilism. Because what we have is the opposite of this. Liberal reformism, a system that celebrates. They used to be four foot underwater, but it's okay. You're only three foot underwater now. Fucking success. And this is seriously considered as progress in terms of both how liberalism is taught in the academy, but also what people understand to be social progress under liberalism. So, to begin to wind up, how can we change what I call us the capitalist scene? We now live in an age where capitalism has changed the geological structures of the planet, and along with that, you know, I think it was Sarah's mentioning the bodies of people in terms of how toxified our bodies are as, as a result of it. I think there's an issue of, you know, this was mentioned, and it's a pity Joe Guinan uh, wasn't here this weekend. You could have talked about, sorry, CWB is community wealth building and these local strategies that we can engage in. What about universities? The trade union movement we mentioned quite a bit, and particularly with a hat tip to, to Sean Sweeney. It's not enough to talk about decarbonizing the energy system. Why can't we democratize the energy system at the same time? It's now much more technically possible with distributed forms of renewable energy that we can democratize and have state ownership, municipal ownership that we have some examples of across uh, Europe. But what about a general strike? It'll be mentioned a few times now. I think we're not quite there yet, um, but I do think we are maybe perhaps moving in that direction. And particularly for those of you who are community activists, um, it, it, one thing you might want to do is to map the assets in your community in terms of the, uh, the people, the skills people have, where are the disused pieces of, of land, uh, the rivers and so on. And I do think, and again, it probably nicely connects with the last session where I, I understood what Dave and, and Paul and uh, Saoirse and Michelle were talking about was to move away from campaigning to organizing and organizing around resources, healthcare, organizing around assets, uh, land and so on. Uh, and it is, and that's something maybe we should do next year at um, the next, um, you know, school, is look at things like modern monetary theory, where there is no limit financially to what a state can do. The only limits we have are the real resources in our economy, not the money that's supposedly not there. And indeed, the issue of organizing them to take state power, and particularly local state power. There is a, a role, I think, for... Uh, not electoralism, but using, getting elected at local government level to use the influence resources and so on to help people. And then, of course, the issue is, as both Bernadette McAllisey said about, well, at what point do we start looking at pacifism? What Paul says, who do we shoot? Um, and there is a fetishization, I think, of nonviolence within certain parts, certainly of the Green Movement, that I do think we need to start uh, questioning. Do we blow up pipelines? Some of you may be aware of this, and I think Paul and I had a discussion on, on Zoom during one of his sessions about, um, I'm not going to talk about that, um, of, of a guy called Andreas Mam, who's now written this very popular book. And, you know, there's a bit maybe of showboating going on there. But I do think there's an issue of raising that question of violence against things as part of uh, a struggle. But it's funny, and I didn't, contact Paul about this beforehand, we already mentioned, and this is where I'm talking about stoicism, the importance of seeing that the, the struggle itself is something that we should get used to. It's not going to be over very, very quickly. You can read it there yourself. It's the idea, and I think many of us intuitively know this, is the idea of struggle as a way of life. As the late great comrade Mel Corrie from Trademark used to always say, life is a struggle, get fucking used to it. Um, and it's this issue of saying, where do we get those resources through events like this, the resilience, the camaraderie, the, the taking the piss out of each other. Yes, the difficult conversations that uh, Paul mentioned as well. But I do think there's an importance of seeing that stoicism uh, of, of fighting for something that we may not be around to see. I've already in, given indication of my own view on this. It's about fighting for a better world for my kids. I'm not going to live to see even if the worst impacts of the planetary crisis 
happens with my children, grandchildren, and all their friends and families. And I do think it's that issue of seeing ourselves involved in a very long struggle for a better world. So if knowledge is power, let's arm ourselves. And that's what we're doing, of course, this weekend. I do think, and it was already mentioned by Vinay in terms of um, Republican prisoners learning the work of Paolo Ferreira. If you've not read The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, I absolutely encourage you to do so. In other words, find a language that fits for the community and people that you're talking to. I'm well aware, as I said, capitalism, neoliberalism doesn't, doesn't go down very well in a lot of working class communities. Fairness does. You know, decency, kindness, meeting our needs and so on. They're the language that resonates with working class communities. And I'll just end on, on this. It's that, it's that idea that we now have compelling scientific evidence to back up our long-standing ideological commitments. That science is now telling us we simply cannot continue the way we're going. And this is, in a way, a non-negotiable scientific proposition. You cannot bargain with the biophysical laws of the universe. But that's exactly what's going on at the moment in terms of leaders in industry, in the state system, trying desperately to deflect from the compelling scientific evidence that we need to change our ways of life. And therefore, only a radical change in our societies will actually bring us the livable world for everybody. So I'm going to leave you with this quote from Gloria Steinman, and then we can have a chat. Thank you.